Uh, okay, thank you for being back. And so our next speaker will be Nana Amakiri on evolving perspectives, updates on X-linked retinitis pigmentosa research. And um, he shared a very interesting um, story with us. He got a Russian blue cat this year. And I think the aim was to have a quiet and dignifying roommate, but it turned out uh, not to be at all like that. And so he now has a troublemaker at home who thinks uh, his keyboard is a prime spot for napping. <laughs> Nana, the stage is yours. Awesome, awesome. Alrighty. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very excited that we had a break, kind of flush out some of those fantastic uh, presentations, set a new bar. Um, for those that uh, actually, first, I, I want to welcome uh, our esteemed guests and uh, actually our new PATH fellows who started this week. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Nana Amakir. I'm one of the third year residents here. Uh, so this is going to be pre predominantly an update from last year I presented on this topic. Uh, I'll start with a quote from Tay Hoha. Uh, she's a Brooklyn uh, writer. She's known for her works on editing To Kill a Mockingbird with uh, Harper Lee. Uh, obviously an incredible work, but she also had this incredible line that I wanted to share with you. Uh, there are a few things in life more heartwarming than to be welcomed by a cat. And so, yes, I most mo more recently uh, I have a new roommate. Her name is Willow, and this is my cat here. Has no relation to the rest of my presentation. I have no financial disclosures. Uh, I'll start by reintroducing what retin retinitis pigmentosa is, uh, give you some study updates, uh, and then some of the conclusions we've been drawing out as well as future aims. And so uh, retinitis pigmentosa is the leading cause of inherited blindness in the US. It affects anywhere from kind of one in 500 to one in 9,000 people uh, worldwide. Um, approximately 2 million people in the world are affected by this disease today. Uh, it's a very clinically and genetically diverse disease. Uh, more prominently, uh, I'm going to focus on the X-linked version of this uh, disease. Uh, the sporadic version is most common. About 20% of people uh, with this are affected by the X-linked version. 90% of that 20% have an RPGR mutation. Uh, and then uh, a much lower percentage uh, with RP2, but it happens to be far more severe. So some of the symptoms, uh, it's a rod predominant disease. And so it manifests with nyctalopia and, and tunnel vision uh, early on in the disease process. Later on, it starts to affect cones as well. And so you can see photopsias, photophobia, uh, as well as just the progression of vision loss. Uh, some of the findings, I discussed this last year, uh, but we'll start with the bone spicule uh, retinal pigmentation. And so we can see that from this photograph on the right here, as well as what a bone spicule in your, in your oral cavity looks like on the left. Uh, uh, part of this classic triad, triad is uh, arterial attenuation and waxy optic disc pallor, uh, which you can see visualized here on this fun this photograph. Uh, and then some pertinent findings, uh, female carriers don't typically manifest with significant disease, um, but they tend to have this tapetal reflex at the macula. And once again, I'm showing you what a tapetum is, the tapeworm. Uh, excellent retinitis pigmentosa, uh, specifically I'm going to focus on the uh, RPGR versus RP2 mutations, kind of discussed it a little bit already. Uh, the reason why it's such an interesting uh, thing to focus on is because there's, it's really hard to, to study inherited retinal diseases because of the lack of ICD-10 billing codes to identify these conditions. And so when we look at the diagnosis and just following disease progression in these patients, uh, there's several modalities we can use to kind of help follow them. Uh, Full-field ERG is super sensitive. Uh, early on, it can show scotopic uh, rod changes, and that manifests as reduced A and B waves. On the left, we have a normal ERG on the right. You can see some of that. Uh, EOG and DA are other uh, modalities you can use to help track and uh, uh, diagnose this disease. Visual field is another modality, uh, kind of like glaucoma. You can see uh, mid-peripheral scotomas and eventually coalesce into a tiny central island. Uh, we can also use OCTs to look for CME in this disease and a lot of inflammatory inherited retinal disease processes. And then, of course, genetics. Currently, in terms of treatment, uh, we have some gene therapies available, as well as symptomatic treatments, whether it's cataract surgery, um, diamox or CME, et cetera, et cetera. 
Last year, I focused on Source, which Ashley brought up earlier today. Uh, so Source, again, is, is a uh, database of academic ophthalmology departments. It helps us aggregate and harmonize data, uh, use it for a variety of different processes, just like in glaucoma, but also uh, especially useful for these rare inherited retinal diseases. Uh, the sites involved, you can see pictured on the left, plentiful. Uh, on the right, I uh, put together a table that helps show how it helps us uh, for our PGR, retinitis pigmentosa. And so uh, study updates for, for our specific project. Uh, today, I'm going to pro provide you um, Moran-specific updates, not uh, using that source database. And so our methods included a retrospective investigation. Uh, we attempted to uh, analyze the difference between RPGR and RP2 using uh, two tail T tests, assuming unequal variance. We also put together some pedigrees, or by we, I mean uh, uh, medical students involved, did fantastic work putting together this pedigree with the help of Emily Spoth. Um, in red, we have the, the patients that were um, deemed RPGR patients. Uh, there's a probably a pretty faint positive and negative sign, the positive being those who tested positive for. Uh, um, retinitis pigmentosa, negative, um, the contrary. And then this is an uh, example RP2 pedigree uh, showing the similar things here. And so our findings, uh, as expected in our 41 patients, uh, RPGR was more prevalent. Uh, about 90% of these patients were male. And then um, most importantly, uh, kind of showed how RP2 was more prevalent. Uh, uh, it showed how RP2 reaches legal blindness at a significantly younger age, about three decades earlier. And so on this uh, graph here, you can see blue is a combination, or blue is RPGR patients, red is RP2, and then green is our combination of both patients. And so on the left, we have the average age at, at diagnosis, which is pretty similar, around 17 years old. And then on the right, we can see that the blue uh, reaches a, uh, legal blindness at around 50 years old, or the fifth decade, and then the red is right around the second decade of life. So a pretty significant difference. So our biggest conclusions were that, uh, again, RP2 is far more significantly, um, uh, progresses far more quicker than RPGR related uh, XLRP. Um, and that is super important for us when it comes to uh, analyzing the phenotypic presentations. Uh, we already knew based on prior literature that there's earlier macular involvement with RP2 related RPG or XLRP. Uh, XLRP. Um, uh, and so we helped quantify this with our study uh, showing how uh, age allele bias was significantly earlier. This helps prompt us to be more uh, targeted with our uh, gene therapies, especially for our RP2-linked cases, given their significantly faster disease progression. And our future uh, research directions right now, um, we're still looking at the consortium with uh, Michigan and some other groups uh, to look at how uh, a larger database would help uh, 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 give us a direction on how to, to move forward with certain therapies. Um, our the, our uh, study in particular showed several limitations, whether it was the size of the group, um, the lack of uh, diversity amongst the group. Um, uh, and hopefully a lot of those things will be solved when we look at that larger database uh, with our source consortium. And so here are some of our key takeaways. And then I have our acknowledgments as well. So I wanted to give a huge shout out to Dr. Roscoe, Dr. Stein, Dr. Stagg uh, for their work and acknowledgments. Uh, and of course, our medical students, Shenna Jensen, who's going to join us next year, as well as Taylor Johnson for, for all of their commitments to this. And then uh, also shout out to ARCS Foundation and, and Carl and Joan Mosk uh, for their generosity and commitments to research. And then I leave you on a slide with uh, uh, pictures from Ithaca, New York, when I was there about a month ago for a wedding. Thank you. and references. Happy to take any questions. So, so I hate it when there's the pressure not to say something and it's building up. So one of my weaknesses, I, I just uh, briefly, uh, somebody stole a lunch when I was in second grade and took somebody else's lunch. The teacher said, you're not going to recess until somebody owns up to that they took the lunch. And the pressure was building, and finally I raised my hand and said, I took the lunch. And teacher said, you didn't really take that lunch. because I didn't know, but I felt awful for everybody. So <laughs> uh, you can call it a weakness and a strength. So, so now that gene therapy is becoming um, better and better, and, and we understand some of the genetic defects, 
uh, really the biggest rate limiting step has to do with the the size of the cohorts for treatment is hard to amortize the expense of making it evolve and, and come into care. But some of these more common genetic, uh, they, they are going to come and, and they're going to be in place. And so all of you who are in this generation, I mean, this, this is going to become an important part of what we do and what we care for. And for those that... The, in all my generation, these were essentially, you're slowly going downhill and it's just a question of how fast. And the treatments were mild things along the pathway, but the overall outcome was inexorable. So I think this is very exciting and uh, understanding the different rates of progression are gonna be very important in knowing where you should really emphasize. Right. And we know some are pretty mild. I mean, it goes, but some are, I mean, RP2 is a, obviously a horrible variant. It goes very fast. Thank you for your comment. Uh, just a quick question. Have you, do you, as a, as a resident, have you seen many patients with this and with this variant? Have you come across that in clinic? How often does that come up for you and how has that been since you've been studying it too? Yeah. Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, I fortunately, uh, on my retina rotation was able to see several of these patients, actually a family, uh, of, uh, uh, several that were affected by uh, RP and it was an RPGR related version. So, uh, uh, I think they were both in their twenties, uh, maybe early thirties for one of them. And, uh, was not uh, as significantly impactful for them yet, uh, but you can better appreciate the research when you can actually see a patient um, who's really affected by it. Uh, and so I would have loved to, to see an RP2 or would love to see an RP2 related uh, XLRP patient in the future, just to see how uh, uh, impactful it might be. One of the things, one of the questions that are, are next steps that come to mind for me with this project is, you know, how can we better quantify or how can we better uh, delineate uh, disease uh, burden? Uh, we use best corrective visual acuity in this case, but obviously we know that, you know, with nyctalopia, with uh, uh, just various, uh, the various ways this disease pre presents, um, it can be hard to, to really uh, accurately quantify the burden that, that these patients have to carry with just visual acuity alone. Uh, so I would love to, to meet more of these patients, maybe get better I idea of what kind of things we can look at to uh, uh, kind of better quantify that. Yes. You know, one of the things we see these kids, kids with these kids, and thank you. <laughs> thing I've been struck with, you know, Ethan. Thank you, Ethan. And by the way, we owe Ethan a huge debt of gratitude for making all of the technological aspects of this come together. But in, in Pete's, we see kids at times who are not seeing as well. They may have failed a screening test. Somebody has concerns, but they don't have the widespread devastating fundus findings. Mm -hmm. And often a little bit of optic nerve pallor, arterial narrowing, maybe all they have and decreased best. So take a careful look at the fundus, a high index of suspicion, because it isn't until later that things are grossly obvious. Identifying them early allows us to provide appropriate support services. So it's good you're presenting this. Yeah. It's important. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Okay, our next, our next speaker is Jordan Desaltes. And he will talk about predicting future cataract surgery volumes at the VA hospital using a Department of Defense demographic projections. And um, where is Jordan? Oh, Maybe, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, and his uh, not really fun fact has something to do that he's so tall. Maybe he got shocked by lightning in uh, um, high school. Not directly hit, <laughs> but shocked by it. <laughs> Probably be safe if you're with me. I'm kind of a lightning rod. Um, is this? I have the specialized AV because I'm a little too tall for that one. But um, um, so thank you. Um, today we'll be talking about exactly like Dr. Fleckenstein said, trying to predict cataract volumes in the future at the VA. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on this project, 320 of the 509 residency positions in the United States are currently supported by the Department of Veterans Affairs, meaning they pay into those salaries. That's about 60% of all residents are supported by the VA. And as we all know, that's the predominant training platform that we use to learn cataract surgery and many other surgeries as we go through our residency. 
And I think we've all, anyone who has been at the VA in any capacity has seen patients come in and they all have a hat on that kind of identifies which conflict they were involved in. And, you know, mostly it's Vietnam and somewhat Korea and every once in a while you'll get a World War II and maybe a Gulf War conflict or two in there somewhere. Um, but it kind of got me thinking after seeing so many Vietnam hats that I would imagine that there's a bubble of these draft era Vietnam veterans that's eventually going to taper off. And I was fairly interested in how that may impact cataract surgery volumes going forward. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the database I use, but I think just intuitively you'd imagine that that would probably decline. And this is going to come over a time period where we know that the demands for ophthalmologic care are going to increase substantially. Um, so in terms of the database used, it's really interesting. The VA actually uses IRS data and their own internal data um, and other survey data to come up with a report that they actually publish on a somewhat irregular uh, update schedule, but it's called the VetPOP database. It was most recently updated in 2020, um, and it essentially gives demographic projections for um, veterans broken up by many different categories out to 2050. Um, and then we also um, incorporated data from other reports that the VA publishes, which predominantly is their utilization profile. So they actually publish every year how many vets are actually using their service and kind of in what capacity. So just to give you a sense of what the overall veteran population is going to look like over the next 25 years or so, currently there's about 19 million U.S. service veterans who are living, um, and that for, that is projected to go down to somewhere around 12 million by um, 2050, and it's going to decline in a fairly linear fashion. But if you break that up a little bit by conflict, what you see is that the World War II veterans obviously taper off quite exponentially um, towards the current era, and then the same thing can be said about the Korean era conflict. And then the Vietnam era veteran population also tapers quite steeply over the next 25 years. And so what we see is that we are actually going to be sustained by a relatively much smaller number of Gulf War era veterans going forward into the future, um, barring any major future conflicts or major draft surges or anything of that nature. If we look at our own state, you can actually, they break this all up by state level. This is uh, for Utah specifically, and the number of veterans um, broken up by age range. And what we see just kind of flipping through the decades here is that year after year after year, slowly the number of veterans available to get cataract surgery will decline um, fa fairly precipitously actually. Um, it's a little bit difficult to ascertain or define really what the exact age window for cataract eligibility is. But if you look at veterans stratified nationally by veterans who are over the age of 45 years old, so kind of getting into that range where they may be getting cataract surgery, you see that there is about a 40% decrease in the number of veterans in that age category by 2050 compared to today. Um, this is a little bit busy of a slide, but we know that the average age in the US overall that people get cataract surgery is about 68, um, and cataracts are usually diagnosed at about 61. So I was also, and I'll go into this a little bit more later, interested in kind of what that 60 and over category looks like as well. One really interesting aspect of the VA is, is actually that there's a huge variance in how people utilize VA services. So what I showed before was all just aggregate veteran data. Only about 50% of veterans use any VA service period. And those services are actually broken down into a lot of individual components. Healthcare is amongst the largest one, but VA services are, they do loan guarantees for houses, they do vocational programs and education and all this stuff. So 
of the 50% who even use any VA benefits at all, about two thirds of them use a healthcare benefit. Um, and then further, of those patients who are actually even using their VA benefits, so that could be in any capacity. That could mean they get their prescriptions through the VA um, or just come for primary care or just get their surgical care through the VA. The VA has looked to see what percent of those patients who get any care at the VA, what percent of them actually rely on the VA for care, and they've broken that down by ser service category. So like outpatient visits, they don't do it specifically for eye care or eye surgery, um, but looking at the outpatient, just VA office-based services, you see that overall about 30 to 45% of veterans rely, who get any healthcare through the VA, rely on the VA for that care. Um, and one of the reasons for that is there's actually a huge number of ancillary uh, ins uh, insurance and payer services that are available to veterans. So as time goes on and uh, supplemental government insurance kicks in and private insurance kicks in, survivorship decreases, over time as they get into those later age categories, really only about 35% um, of them or so actually rely on the VA for their care. Um, and you can see here from the VA's published databases that about 50% of them have uh, Medicare, TRICARE is another large uh, component, um, and then uh, other private insurances as well. And this is essentially just summarizing um, everything I said, but when I make my projections, I'm essentially using a 37.5% as the reliance um, percentage, just based on the average of all the sources that the VA has um, taken in for their reliance data. So when you superimpose the number of veterans who actually receive their VA benefits on the total number of veterans, and then reduce that even further in green, you see the ones who are actually receiving any VA healthcare at all. And then in this smallest purple bar here, you see the ones who actually rely on the VA for healthcare. You see that it's actually a fairly small um, percentage of the total, and it's decreasing fairly proportionately to the overall decline in veteran population. So if we think about our cataract eligible patients, patients who are like, say, 45 and older or 60 years and older, and I've shown those two categories here. What we see is that for the 45 and older category, in just three cycles of residence, so three more generations of residents come through 12 years, there's already going to be a 20% decrease in essentially cataract eligible veterans at the VA. Um, and if you do that by the 60 and up category, it's about 22 um, in just six resident cycles, so at around that 2048, 2050 period, there is projected to be a decrease of about 40% uh, in terms of the number of veterans who are eligible to receive cataract surgery. And this is all going to occur at a time when the uh, overall population is increasing and aging and the demand for private ophthalmologic care or university-based ophthalmologic care is going to continue to increase, projected to increase about 25%, and the pressure to recruit more residents to deal with that volume is going to increase. So we're going to have to um, essentially figure this out over time. Um, and this is all um, assuming that, you know, we don't have a major conflict or something like that, or that there's not a major change in um, veteran attitudes towards healthcare over time. I, uh, I'll finish with a little anecdote. I, my brother is actively deployed in the Pacific right now, and I called him, he's 28 years old, and I called him last week, and I was like, if you're losing vision in one or both eyes, how long would you wait to get that evaluated? And he was like, probably two or three weeks. I'd probably just let it, let it ride for a little bit. So I don't, think the, I don't think the attitudes will change too much going forward. But, um, and so that's essentially um, all I have. Um, and going into the future, we're going to break this down by state and looking at all the individual VAs and because there's a fairly large trend towards urbanization with the veteran population as well. Um, so kind of more rural VAs will be hit harder by this, but I think it's going to be significant over our lifetimes for sure. Any questions?
I guess it better be consistent. Uh, so the metrics that you talk about, you know, are very, very real. But remember a couple of things in regards to this equation. Yeah, we're going to be seeing less veterans and, and, and uh, barring a conflict, heaven forbid, we wouldn't want that. But barring a major conflict, there's going to be smaller conflagrations. That's just been kind of part of the national, international scene, but barring that. But uh, you need to remember that the, uh, our aging population is is obviously an incredible bolus that's going to continue because our birth rate is low enough that that's going to be a greater and greater part of the population. Whereas the number of ophthalmologists to take care of that and performing surgery has been relatively fixed and hasn't really changed much in 30 years. Reason that is, is because of the rules and regulations necessary to get a certified residency under ACGME are so onerous, it's, it's actually very difficult to do, and it's become very expensive. So I'm predicting for all of you, and at least the numbers I'm seeing, that there will probably be already here uh, by you know 2035 to 2040, so we're talking like 10 years, uh, at least a 25% shortage of uh, ophthalmologists and already be growing. So uh, the residents will have plenty of room in regards to helping take care of other areas of the population that will more than make up for what we're losing in the veterans population. And all of you are going to be in extremely high demand. And it's I'm already seeing it. I'm having colleagues with big practices and more rural and less uh, in areas of interest who just can't get a recruit. They tell me. 15 years ago, I had 10 applications. I haven't been able to find a decent application now in three years to, you know, to try to take over this practice or move in. So you, all of you are going to be, as, as you finish, you're all going to be very, very busy. Yeah, I have no doubt about that, but it certainly will change where we do those surgeries. Jeez. <laughs> you know, congratulations on looking at this question. It, it, it is very important. And, you know, just going back a little bit, we we saw a lot of this happening. It was you know during the past 12, 15 years that uh, we had this transition to community care, these other outside uh, opportunities for veterans to receive care. We noted a decrease then, and that decrease has been kind of slowly uh, increasing in terms of proportion because they got their system you know tighter, improved. Patients got used to getting care closer to home, and frankly, that's great. I mean, it's kind of what you want for patients. I mean, driving two hours for just a cataract surgery and getting close to home, you know, it's pretty unreasonable. And uh, in 2019, our Salt Lake City VA did a study, and it very much mirrors exactly what you're sh showing. It was a 14% decrease in the number of patients in the Salt Lake City uh, kind of metropolitan area, this this idea of this 45-minute drive time, 20% uh, uh, less patients will be getting care over that period of time. And there has been a deliberate uh, but slightly quiet but very intentional effort to ensure that, you know, you as residents have been able to continue to have the cataract numbers you've needed, even though we've added an additional resident. But that's come through our faculty here. Uh, it is not normal in academic medicine to have sit with an attending and have half of their private patients go to a resident. That just doesn't happen. And yet that's what is currently happening. And, and while you know, Randy is spot on and the Berkowitz paper says the same thing, there's gonna be a relative shortage. That there's going to be a lot of cataracts that need to be done. But every time we sit down, you know, we do about 20% less cataracts when we're operating with a resident and we'll feel those same uh, increased demands of patients. And yet um, there's a reason why there's not private practice residencies popping up and it's because it's expensive uh, and it does take time. And it is such a core part of what Moran was built on with Randy and Alan. And again, I just want to acknowledge faculty for continuing to, to carry that forward because you know, if you just look at the numbers, it doesn't look great for adding a fifth resident unless we continue with that uh, culture of you know dedicated, ensuring that we're one of the best training programs. Yeah. Brandon. One more question. common as well, or county hospitals. So, you know, just anticipating the trends of what you're presenting, 
in addition to knowing that other residency programs don't have faculty who, who turn over cases, in addition to the decrease in VA or no county hospital, what do you think in regards to like a, a reasonable solution to this issue? I know it's a complex question and maybe better one for our academic team, but it's just, it's interesting and I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm not entirely sure, um, but I think I think that institutions will also need to expand the places that they're doing surgery, and I think that like a lot of those VA patients can come through community care still to universities, and then just expanding and being willing to go out to places that need care um, and have a presence. You know, if you look at like the U and how they've done a lot of their primary care outreach there all over the state, like in every nook and cranny. And I think that that may be something going forward too with ophthalmology programs is more satellites, more um, things like that, where residents are able to operate at satellite. Yeah. J Jordan, the answer to every question is money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and effectively that's it. It will require subsidization. We've looked at expanding, I mean, you know, I've, I've never said to residents, we've looked at Grand Junction as an option because that, that, that's the closest VA where you could do something like that. And it's not a great option in the end, but even though, again, we can expand to sites, the question is who's going to pay yeah. for it and how, and, and that is the answer is who's going to pay for it. All right. Thanks, Jordan. This thing's way up here. All right, we're going to move on to our PGY2 residents. Eric Ortz is going to talk to us about uh, some issues related to albinism and uh, uh, foveal architecture, uh, which I'm personally excited to hear about. But first, her fun fact. Um, she's a flute player. She played flute through grad school and med school. So if anyone has a band, they need a flute player, she is available. <laughs> I have the opposite problem with mics as Dr. Jess tells. So um, we're balancing everything out here. Thanks for the uh, free advertisement, Dr. Hoffman. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today um, about uh, the some of the work that I did towards the end of my uh, PhD's dissertation work, looking at the connection between foveal hypoplasia and visual acuity in human albinism. I'm especially excited to announce this was recently published in IOVS. It was a very long and arduous journey to publication, but if you have more questions about it um, after the talk, you can always refer to the paper. So first I'm gonna tell you about albinism. And as most of the people in this room know, this is a genetic condition that affects either the synthesis or trafficking of melanin pigment, particularly earlier in uh, neonatal development. And this turns out to be really consequential for the development of the visual system. So people with albinism have a few key features of their visual system that are atypical. First, they um, pretty much always have foveal hypoplasia. And this is shown in these two OCTs showing both someone with normal foveal architecture. And basically the normal fovea is characterized by, um, let me get my pointer up here, great, uh, lateral displacement of these inner retinal layers. So that at the bottom of the foveal pit, you have only outer retinal layers present. Whereas in foveal hypoplasia, those inner retinal layers persist through where the fovea should be. And in this person who has albinism, their foveal hypoplasia is so severe that you don't even really see any semblance of a foveal pit. And this is even more obvious when we look at this in three dimensions, the presence versus absence of a foveal pit. This is usually also accompanied by the absence of a foveal avascular zone. So when we look at this with OCT angiography, um, typically in a normal fovea, the uh, inner capillary plexus has this avascular zone at the location of the foveal pit. But in foveal hypoplasia, that avascular zone is absent. There's persistence of vessels all the way through. People with albinism also have abnormal decussation of optic nerve fibers at the optic chiasm that leads to atypical representation of visual space in the visual cortex, but I'm not going to talk about those in detail today. Clinically, people with albinism tend to present with nystagmus, photophobia, changes in their depth perception, as well as reduced visual acuity. 
But of these features, the reduced visual acuity is really the thing that tends to have the biggest impact on quality of life and on lifestyle decisions. And this can range very widely. Some people have nearly normal visual acuity around 2025, whereas others are legally blind. So this has led to a lot of work to try to understand what are those cellular and structural underpinnings that ultimately determine visual function. And as it turns out, just like visual acuity, foveal hypoplasia also represents a really wide structural spectrum. So here I'm showing you OCTs from five people who have albinism, and you can already appreciate that all of them have kind of a different degree of foveal specialization. And we can categorize these using a grading scheme um, using this algorithm that was developed by originally by a group in the UK and later modified by my predecessor in the lab at our group at MCW that we now call the Lester grading system for foveal hypoplasia. And it relies on three key anatomical features of the normal fovea, first being the presence of that physical pit, the lateral displacement of the inner retinal layers, outer segment lengthening, and outer nuclear layer widening. So in the most, uh, or in the least severe version of foveal hypoplasia, this person still has foveal hypoplasia because you can appreciate that um, there's still persistence of these inner retinal layers at the bottom of the foveal pit, but the size of this pit is actually within normal limits. Um, this person also has OS elongation and ONL thickening. In grade 1B, they have a shallow depression, but now we're outside the range of normal. And again, we see these two other features. Whereas in grade 2, now we've lost that foveal pit completely. Still with the ONL thickening and OS elongation. In grade three, we lose both the pit and that OS elongation. And in grade four, none of these features is present. Now this grading system has a few strengths. First, it is roughly correlated with visual acuity. Um, and so you can see that people who have more severe foveal hypoplasia also have worse visual acuity. And it turns out of all of the features in albinism that we see, foveal hypoplasia really is the best, uh, has the best correlation with overall acuity. However, it also has a few weaknesses. First, it is categorical, so kind of getting to some of the points that Dr. Polsky was making earlier in her talk about kind of trying to reduce a continuous metric down to categories. You know, it's based on these all or none, is a feature present or absent um, decisions that are sometimes subjective as well. Um, and the subjectivity might have even been apparent to you when I was showing you these images, and you might have said, I would have graded that image really differently, and that's exactly the point. So what we wanted to see, um, where all of this is, is important because in the clinical context, we really want to be able to provide uh, people who are getting a new diagnosis of albinism with a rough prediction of what their visual acuity might be. Am I going to be on that near normal visual acuity side of the spectrum, or am I going to be on that uh, more severe uh, vision loss side. And this is particularly important because a lot of people are diagnosed in childhood when they might not be able to participate in visual acuity measurements. And so parents might want to know, am I going to have to plan for um, special assistive devices in school? Am I going to need to adjust my expectations of what my child might think of their life as being in the future? So what we wanted to know is whether we might develop a more quantitative method for assessing foveal hypoplasia and whether that might end up being even a better predictor of visual acuity. So what we did is we uh, recruited 90 people who had confirmed likely or suspected albinism. And we kind of came up with these categories just based on some of the inherent ambiguity in diagnosing albinism. So we based it both on genetic and clinical features. Ultimately, we had to exclude 19 people from the final analysis just for image quality reasons. Um, but we first measured visual acuity. And then we also collected OCT images of the fovea using really meticulous methods, both to collect the images and to process them, really to make sure that we're getting the best images of the fovea and also maximizing our image quality. After that, first we graded them using the existing Lester system, and then we also developed some quantitative techniques for measuring specialization that I'll go into in the next slide. We then use linear regression modeling to see how both the Lester system, this categorical system, and our quantitative metrics uh, performed at predicting the visual acuity of our participants. So I mentioned that we had to come up with a way to quantify foveal specialization. And recall in this current categorical system, there, we're relying on a few key um, features of the fovea. But the caveat with each of these features is that all of them are assessed at the fovea relative to the paraphobia. So this isn't just a measurement at the center. So what we did using an example 
uh, with outer segment lengthening, is we developed a ratio where we measured these features both at the fovea and at a point in the parafovea and calculated a ratio so that a higher number represents greater foveal specialization. And I can show you in uh, this example, these are two individuals who both have grade two bilustral system foveal hypoplasia, but when we compare the length of their outer segment at the fovea versus the parafovea, that each of them really has a different uh, relative amount of lengthening and so end up having very different uh, OS ratios that are ultimately calculated. We did the same thing for um, the inner retinal layer ratio, which this just represents that uh, lateral displacement of the inner layers and the formation of the pit, as well as for the outer nuclear layer ratio or the ONL ratio that represents ONL widening. And again, across all of these metrics, we were noticing that even within a particular categorical grade, there was a really wide range of specialization that um, it's, this isn't an all or none, is the specialization there, is it not, that people with the same grade have a lot of variability. So next we wanted to kind of compare some of these metrics to each other and to visual acuity. And so first we looked just at our population and our categorical grading, and we found that yes, indeed, our categorical grades still continue to correlate with visual acuity. And this just helps us to show that we can replicate the findings that have been shown by other groups before us. One of the things that was striking to us though, is that there's really a lot of overlap in visual acuity between these categorical grades. So I can even draw your attention on this slide to the visual acuity in grade 1B versus grade three. And the difference between these two groups in visual acuity was statistically significant, but the ranges of visual acuity are 100% overlapping in grade three, which kind of, again, illustrates some of the limitations of the system for differentiating between good versus poor visual acuity. Next, we looked at the, or the uh, quantitative metrics that we developed, and we wanted to uh, look at how they correlated with the categorical grade. And we show that all of these quantitative metrics do indeed correlate with categorical grade, which just helps us to be a little bit more assured that yes, our novel quantitative metrics that we came up with are really representing that kind of same spectrum of fo foveal specialization as the existing system. So the exciting part was when we looked at the linear regression models, and we found that our quantitative metrics ended up uh, accounting for more of the variability in visual acuity than the categorical grades. Um, and so I'm showing you here some of the kind of the descriptors of these two models. So again, there's two models, one that's based on categorical grade, and the, uh, this combined linear model basically takes all of our quantitative metrics and puts them into one singular predictive model. This one we also, um, incorporated uh, participant age into this as well. And it, when we look at the R squared, which is a numeric representation of how well this model performs at predicting visual acuity, you can see that this linear model using the quantitative metrics did a little bit better at predicting visual acuity than the categorical model. This is also evident when we look at the correlation between the acuity that our model predicted versus the observed actual visual acuity that we saw in our population. And you can see, a, here I'm showing you on the left is the correlation between predicted and observed for the categorical model, and on the right is for the quantitative model. And where the dashed line represents perfect agreement between the model and our observations. And so you can see that for the uh, quantitative model on the right, those uh, data points are lying a little bit closer to that agreement line than for the categorical model. The other way we looked at the agreement between these two models is using a Bland-Altman analysis, which I'm showing here. And if you're familiar with Bland-Altman, then you know that greater agreement means that this um, central line here is going to be flat and near zero, and your limits of agreement represented by the dashed lines are going to be closer together. And when we compare the categorical model here on the left with the quantitative model, again, with our quantitative model, we get a little bit flatter line, slightly closer together limits of agreement, which again is showing that our model is doing just a little bit better job at predicting acuity than the existing categorical grading. So what can we conclude from this? So we already knew going into this that foveal hypoplasia is the best structural predictor of visual acuity and albinism that we have, which is why we're really interested in kind of building on what we know and seeing if we can make it even a little bit better. And we did find that these um, quantitative metrics, first of all, we're demonstrating a lot more variability in foveal structure than really what we're capturing by just a categorical model. That again, all of these specializations represent this continuous spectrum of development. Um, in the end, the quantitative uh, metrics, they do a little bit better job of 
uh, predicting visual acuity than the categorical model. But the key here is that there really wasn't a lot of improvement. And at the end of the day, the this quantitative model only accounted for about half of the variability in visual acuity. So what this tells us that even though foveal hypoplasia might be the best uh, structural predictor we have so far, there's probably a lot of other pieces that are going into determining visual acuity that we're not accounting for in this model. Um, some of the things that we've considered are things like uh, disruption in the private line neural circuitry that we know exists at the fovea. That's that specialized connection between cones and ganglion cells that normally exists is probably disrupted in albinism. Um, and nystagmus and optical quality might also play a role. And if you're at Arvo this year, there was a special symposium on albinism where a few different groups were kind of commenting on some of these um, proposed uh, components. So with that, I'd like to thank, first and foremost, the uh, co-authors on this paper. Um, and again, this was kind of the final project that I completed while I was in graduate school. So I also want to acknowledge the lab that I did my PhD in, the Carroll Lab at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, I also want to acknowledge all the study participants and families. A lot of these um, individuals were coming great distances to participate in the study and are really excited about being able to help future generations of people with albinism through um, their participation. Um, as well as the National Organization for Albinism and Hypopigmentation. This is kind of the patient advocacy organization here in the United States that supports um, people with albinism and their families. And they were really helpful in allowing us to use their networks and um, resources to recruit participants for the study, as well as the funding sources that are shown here. And with that, I will take any questions. Yeah, Dr. Polsky. Um, that was amazing, Erica. You're awesome. Um, Thanks. I was just curious. Do you know if there's um, like does the does the patient's age um, impact the how this kind of predictive model how accurate it is in predicting whether visual acuity will be like, is there an age window or an age threshold that you have to meet in order for, for it to work the best? Yeah, this is a really big point of discussion in uh, using. OCT imaging to correlate with visual function in this population because, um, you know, for us, we're a little bit limited by, first of all, by patients that are able to do kind of standard OCT imaging. Um, in our population, I think that our youngest participant was seven, um, but clearly a lot of these uh, kids are getting diagnosed at much younger ages. And so there's, um, the group in Leicester has done a lot of really good work showing um, work using like handheld OCT in younger kids um, to have some correlation with future visual acuity there. We do know also that um, visual acuity tends to improve a little bit for during the first two decades of life in albinism. So even if you are seeing a young child um, who has pretty poor acuity, they're acuity will probably continue to improve a little bit before up to about the age of 20. Um, and so there's definitely some limitations in our study in terms of, you know, where this is definitely a kind of a snapshot in time. We're not looking at this longitudinally or um, able to account for the age, but that's something that I think um, in the future as we're continuing to look for some of these structural predictors will take into account. Do you think that their foveal architecture present at birth is the same as what you would see in that seven-year-old? No. Or because it's, I mean, from my yeah. perspective, it's a dynamic process in terms of ongoing foveal development. So we need to be mm -hmm. careful with that. The question yeah. the parents want answered is, what's my child going to see when, they go, when he or she goes to school? Mm -hmm. That's the real issue at mm -hmm. four to six months of age. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this, this is what do, you, yeah. what do you think? Absolutely. No, I think that's a really good point. We know that even normally, normal foveal development per, continues through to about two or three years of age. And in albinism, that process might even be extended a little bit longer. And um, I think one of the strengths of our study is because all of our participants were a little older, we were looking at kind of their end stage um, foveal structure. And so I think that that uh, improves some of the, the predictive value. But I think that you're right that in the future, um, it'll help us if we kind of understand how much change in that structure we can expect so that we can then kind of extrapolate that to what we're predicting based on images acquired at an earlier age. Oh, this, is, this is really cool stuff, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? One more. I yeah. Albinism is way more common than you think. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you go through training thinking, oh, I'll be able to pick up those albinism kids. But I have more than a few that just don't have good corrected acuity and you get an OCT and they've got a foveal hypoplasia. So, um, uh, 
and some of these kids won't cooperate for, you know, with the nystagmus, it's really hard to get OCTs on kids. Um, so I found genetic testing very helpful and we've, it's much easier now than it was when I started 12 years ago to get, to get, to get these kids tested for that. But that, that can also be another one, but in general, you know, without being able to get an OCT, which is what you're not able to get in most of these kids, looking at their nystagmus is, gives you a pretty good idea of what their vision is going to be in the end. So, and, and most parents want to know, is this kid going to drive or not? And you can kind of tactfully conjecture on that based on the nystagmus. Next up, we have George Sanchez. George is going to talk to us about variations, fluctuations diurnally in IOP, both before and after laser trabeculoplasty. And let me find his fun fact here. What fun fact? Oh, um, he had a previous career um, before medical school uh, doing research uh, uh, involving the health of uh, prospective NFL players. For the New England Patriots. Um, so um, that's an interesting aside, and uh, we'll have to chat about that. That's great. You're up. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. Um, I don't know about a career, but yes, I, that was a former job of mine. Um, anyways, today I'm going to be talking about um, fluctuations in IOP before and after selective laser trabeculoplasty using the iCare home tonometry. So before I get started, I just wanna thank Dr. Barbara Roscoe, Dr. Katherine Johnson. Um, they've been very instrumental in helping me with this project and I just can't thank them enough um, and everybody else that's helped me with this project. Um, so no financial disclosures to report. Um, and then I just give a little bit of background here. So um the first sort of paper that ever discussed using laser to treat glaucoma um, was published back in 1973 and i wanted to include this just to show how far we've come um, the advances we've made and i kind of highlighted this um, little sentence that the article included third approach through the use of laser and so back then it was only medication and surgery and i love the description towards the end the summary statement being a new procedure of piercing the anterior chamber angle by a laser beam. And at that time, um, 10 patients were treated, nine out of 10 showed a decrease in intraocular pressure following the laser treatment. Um, and uh, moving forward, so six years after that original paper, uh, argon laser therapy for um, uh, the angle uh, was published by Wise and Witter. Um, and so ALT came onto the scene and then by 95, uh, the first paper investigating the use of SLT by Latina and Park, although this was just a sort of uh, research paper that involved looking at bovine cells, um, specifically pigment, uh, trabecular meshwork pigmented cells, and how they responded to laser. Um, three years after that, um, the first clinical study on um, SLT was presented, and back then they included a total of 53 patients 30 uh, POAG naive and 30 uh, POAG after already receiving argon laser, uh, argon laser therapy. Um, and so back then 180 um, degrees of treatment um, with 50 spots total. Um, and at 26 week follow-up, we see that both um, sets of patients responded nicely to the uh, laser treatment therapy uh, with about a six uh, millimeter of mercury drop in pressure, both to, regardless of whether or not they received ALT. Um, and so then moving forward, so this was 2019. Um, so about 20 years into the future, um, we have the light study. And so the light study shows us that um, the clinical trial, 652 patients, um, and they kind of compared uh, treatment-naive patients with POAG who received either drops at first or SLT, um, and they kind of followed these patients for 36 months, and they showed that 74% of the patients who did receive the SLT at three years out had uh, no need to be put on drops. Um, and then as far as um, progression of disease um, and pressure, um, both, uh, both SLT and DROPS groups were comparable. Um, so it shows that SLT might be something you should consider as a first line in a patient who's coming in, and maybe you're considering starting them on DROPS. Maybe before we start them on DROPS, think about SLT. Uh, and then the LIGHT study kind of looked three years uh, forward, 
um, so a six year results. And this kind of just um, reiterates that same point that they made in their original study. Um, 652 originally in the 2019 study, but 524 in this one. Um, and as we see, they kind of compare drops versus SLT. Um, and there was actually a significant difference in disease progression with SLT showing uh, less uh, disease progression versus the patients who were started on drops originally. Um, the other comparison, so if um, you did get SLT, less likely to end up having to get a uh, trabeculectomy. And then at um, six years out, patients who were drop-free without incisional surgery, um, SLT patients um, were actually more likely not to have to uh, need drops or have an incisional surgery six years out. And interestingly, 90% of patients who are drop free, drop free without incisional surgery underwent two uh, treatments of SLT. And that kind of leads me to my next point, um, just the, repeat the repeatability of SLT. So in this paper published in 2016, uh, 173 patients um, you know, with a variety of different types of glaucoma diagnoses, all underwent SLT 360 degrees. Um, and as you can see, at the first SLT treatment, um, prior to the treatment, 20.3 um, um, as far as the IOP, after the treatment, 16.4. And we see a similar drop, um, even though they already had received an SLT treatment prior. So on that second treatment, uh, it went from 19.4 to 16.7. So very comparable, regardless of whether or not they've already received SLT. Um, and so uh, my uh, project had to do with doing SLT and then using eye care home before and after to kind of understand how that pressure is fluctuating over the course of the day. And so the eye care home was originally FDA approved in 2017. As you can see, there's a video here of someone um, measuring their own pressure with that device. Um, and it's been validated multiple times over. A lot of studies have come out uh, regarding eye care home and its ability to effectively and reliably predict IOP compared to gold standard um, sort of methods like Goldmon. And so the last point I wanted to make as far as IOP fluctuation, whether or not that actually predicts glaucoma progression. So it's a point of contention um, in the literature. Um, there are papers who say that um, IOP fluctuation it does predict glaucoma progression. So here on the left-hand side, we see uh, post-hoc analyses of the AGIS study, post hoc analyses of the SIGIT study, all saying, yes, fluctuation does predict future progression of glaucoma. But on the other hand, there's also papers that say otherwise. So um, recently at the Glaucoma, Glaucoma Journal Club meeting um, last month, uh, we reviewed a paper um, that came out earlier this year that kind of was against the idea of IOP fluctuation predicting glaucoma progression um, as far as diurnal fluctuation. They did study a more short-term sort of IOP fluctuation, like ocular pulse amplitude. Um, but as far as what we think of as diurnal fluctuation, um, that paper kind of disagreed with the point that that predicts glaucoma progression. And then the early manifest glaucoma trial um, on a post hoc analysis also kind of did, didn't agree with the idea of IOP fluctuation predicting glaucoma progression. So it's definitely a point of contention that requires just future research uh, to really understand. And so the purpose of our study was to kind of assess how um, pressure fluctuates in patients after they've already received, uh, already received SLT. And so we had 50 participants, 50 eyes, uh, with either a glaucoma diagnosis or ocular hypertension diagnosis. Um, and so we did a total of six measurements um, distributed evenly over the course of the day from like 6 a.m. all the way up through the evening time uh, for seven days total. And they would do this for, yeah, for the week total before the SLT treatment at six weeks after, three months after, six months after, um, to kind of understand um, how the uh, IOP responds to the SLT. Um, and so our cohort was 50, um, average age of about 64 as far as the demographics. And I just wanted to include this slide to kind of give everybody a sense of what um, the eye care home website looks like as we look into a patient's profile. And then we just see how a lot of different values are included as far as the report, whether that's the max IOP, the mean IOP, the range, um, and the standard deviation. And so at baseline, we just see these values here. Um, and just to give a summary statement as far as the six weeks, three months, and six months uh, measures. So max IOP did have a significant decrease um, by 17%. Uh, the mean IOP 
uh, interestingly enough, um, was significantly different at the six week and three month mark, uh, but not significantly, not significantly different at the six month mark. Um, and the range and the standard deviation of the of those measures uh, were both significantly decreased at um, the visit thereafter. And so just preliminarily, um, you know, as we gather more data, this is we're in the middle of just collecting more and more to get all the three month measurements and the six month measurements. But preliminarily, there is a decrease in the IOP fluctuation after SLT uh, from baseline that we can that we can see by six weeks right after we do the treatment. Um, and then just future directions for the project and the data that we have. Um, so we're also looking at doing subgroup analyses, kind of understanding demographic factors, um, like whether or not they've showed up already on medication, diagnoses. Um, we submitted an abstract to women in ophthalmology that was accepted, um, looking at certain, certain factors that might make someone a better candidate for SLT. Um, and then what we found based on this was that patients who are less than 60 years old, uh, male, um, coming in treatment naive, so on zero medications, and even patients who had prior SLT done already uh, demonstrated a better response to SLT um, following the treatment. And so I just want to thank ARCS. Uh, so we'll... Oh, well, I just want to say thank you to ARCS for allowing me to make this project possible, um, and everyone else has um, helped me with it. I, I really want to thank everyone. Thanks. Go ahead. <laughs> so, so now that we can start looking at what those fluctuations, it, it proves exactly what, Craig, you were talking about. How just picking one pressure, or, or the earlier talk as well, is kind of a fool's errand. I mean, uh, a standard deviation of 3.3 and, and a variation where you're going to be 16 and 24. Uh, and we know just after somebody really exercises or drink a cup of coffee, and the really big variation were when it was popular for people to, you know, to hang upside down for a period of time is uh, for back issues and problems where your everybody's pressure goes way up. So I, I think this is this is going to be critical. And now we know that the greater the fluctuation, particularly those higher pressures that are happening, you know, in, in the earlier morning, are probably one of the biggest factors associated with glaucoma. I think we're going to see this just becoming more and more standard of how we're going to take care of our glaucoma patients and the treatments that do the best job of blunting that big pressure increase and at the same time lowering pressure. But that blunting of that maximum pressure is probably going to become more important than even what the mean pressure is. Thank you so much for your comment. Yeah. Thanks so much for your talk. And um, the one of the things you mentioned is that people who had had previous SLT um, had a little bit better response in terms of kind of blunting that fluctuation. And it, it seems like there's kind of been some discussion. I know that it's become more people are more likely to do SLT multiple times than previously. You know, and, and I guess my question is, do you see this as as moving towards more seeing as SLT as a procedure that we might expect to do more than once for a patient rather than trying to counsel them that this should be a one and done procedure? Yeah, so um, thanks so much for the question. Um, so Dr. Roscoe uh, sent me in, um, Catherine, Dr. Johnson, uh, a text the other day because she's at Arvo and she showed us a, sent us a picture of a magazine article just discussing SLT that Dr. Ahmed actually um, was one of the authors on. And it was talking about SLT as a first line treatment um, based on the light uh, trial. Um, but I definitely, I definitely think that moving forward, SLT is probably going to be something that we offer, especially to patients who are treatment naive, never received any sort of treatment. Um, and then something to consider um, in the future, maybe as uh, something that we do before going through a surgery or doing something more invasive. Um, but that's kind of what my understanding of it is. I'd love Dr. Chai to chime in as well. Yeah, just there next year there'll be results that'll be released. I don't remember where the trial's actually taking place. I think it's mainly out of the UK. But what they're doing, it's actually multinational too, but I think the principal investigators are out of the UK. But what they're looking at is maintenance SLT. So low dose SLT on a yearly basis, will you be able to maintain the effect of SLT versus our current paradigm, which is just treat and wait. We treat, 
and then we wait to see if that effect starts to diminish, and then we retreat. So those will be some very interesting findings where it may change how we perform SLT more on a maintenance basis rather than treating weight. The other plug I want to put in is just for our group in general that this, and there are two terms that are used in the literature. One is diurnal, referring to more daytime changes, but Ariana 11 was really great in terms of publishing a paper that we did in our group looked at, looking at this term of nictahemeral. Nictahemeral better describes kind of the 24-hour pattern that you see with a lot of glaucoma patients. And so we're now crossing over into other areas. Uh, our neuro-ophthalmology group is particularly interested in the effect of nictahemeral IOP changes with NION patients. In addition, we're also doing some work that Catherine has helped start this year uh, with one of our medical students, Azra, in terms of CPAP, for example, we recommend oftentimes that patients with sleep apnea should get treatment with CPAP, but there is some early evidence to suggest that the CPAP treatment alone may actually elevate episcleral venous pressure and contribute to elevated IOP at night. So while we want to improve oxygenation, we may be hurting ourselves by actually elevating episcleral venous pressure in the process. So a lot of things that we're going to be hopefully figuring out clinically with nictohemeral IOP measurements with home tonometry. Thanks, Dr. Good example of suddenly more aggressive treatment for uh, high blood pressure. And we suddenly saw a lot of glaucoma patients getting dramatically worse very rapidly. And uh, uh, so always something to think about. It, it, everything looks golden at front, but it's over time sometimes you realize what the real outcomes are going to be. Thanks, everybody. Our next speaker is Aisha Patil, and she will talk about the relationship between exfoliation syndrome and abdominal aortic aneurysms. And um, Aisha's favorite hobby is yoga, and um, she actually is doing yoga for over seven years, and she took already over 600 classes. Thanks everyone, I'm happy to be here. Um, so one interesting thing is before I was interested in medicine, I was actually very interested in public health. So I'm excited to present this research today, which is a bridge between my two interests, public health and medicine. I don't have any conflicts of interest. So to briefly review exfoliation syndrome, um, this is, was also covered by Dr. Orozco in her grand rounds a few weeks ago, but it is a systemic disease characterized by the production and deposition of fibrillary extracellular matrix material. And we see it in systemic and ocular tissue. Typically within the eye, we see it located on the anterior capsule, lens annules, and in the iridocorneal angle viewed by gonioscopy. This was first described in 1917 by John Lindbergh, who at the time was a Finnish ophthalmology resident um, and looked at around, uh, he looked at patients and around 50% of them over the age of 60 had this exfoliation material present in their eyes. And those diagrams on the slide are images that he drew of what he was seeing at the time. We also know that exfoliation syndrome can lead to exfoliation glaucoma, and this is the second most common cause of secondary open angle glaucoma. And glaucoma in itself is a leading cause of blindness worldwide behind cataracts, AMD, and refractive error. As far as the pathogenesis of this, this is kind of up for debate. Traditionally, it's been thought to be linked to um, lysyl oxidase like one risk alleles, but more recently, people are exploring the idea that maybe this is more epigenetics and things like environmental factors, like UV exposure um, and geographic latitude. Looking at the epidemiology of it, um, the prevalence varies maybe from 10 to 20 percent in people over the age of 60. Um, in specific populations like Greenland Inuits, there's 0 percent present in studies they've done, 25 percent in northern Sweden residents, and 0.7 percent among Navajo Nation residents. Um, and Dr. Orozco and her group have done a lot of different um, studies to show systemic comorbidities that are related to it, including COPD, AFib, um, 
obstructive sleep apnea and POP and inguinal hernias as well. Other groups have looked at different cardiovascular um, diseases that can be associated with it, including hypertension, myocardial infarctions, heart failure, ischemic heart disease. And when I joined the group, I wondered, could there be any relationship between abdominal aortic aneurysms? Because when I think about the aorta, I think about a lot of elastin. So just briefly reviewing what a triple A is, this is specifically um, a dilation of greater than three centimeters or a diameter larger than 50% at the aortic diameter at the level of the diaphragm. And this is specifically located between the renal arteries and the inferior aortic bifurcation. As far as prevalence, it's um, about 8% in men over the age of 50 and 1.3% in women over the age of 50. The main risk factors are male sex, smoking, age, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and it is the 10th leading cause of mortality in men over the age of 65. This has vastly improved since um, the United States Prevention Task Force has implemented screening guidelines for AAA. And as far as the pathophysiology here, um, it's primarily ECM degradation and smooth muscle apoptosis. That's essentially a response from intense inflammation. So similar to what I was asking, could exfoliation syndrome and AAA be related? Others have also already studied, studied this. So in looking at the literature, when we did a Prisma systemic review analysis, um, there were six main studies that came up. Uh, the first three studies in this table were supporting an association between these two diseases, and the last three studies were against an association. So there was a bit of controversy that was existing around this. I just want to highlight two of the studies. Um, the first one, Schumacher, that was in 2001. This looked at uh, 55 exfoliation syndrome patients um, and found an association. But what I thought was most interesting is they did a post-mortem analysis of aortic wall. They did tissue biopsies, and they actually saw um, a difference in the extracellular matrix in patients with exfoliation syndrome and abdominal aortic aneurysms. Um, and then the second study to highlight here is the French et al. study that was done in 2012. This was probably the largest study um, with 126,000 patients that were uh, reviewed through the VA healthcare system. Um, so it was a primarily male population. And this also suggested that there was an association between the two. So when we started looking at how could we review this ourselves, we also use the Utah Population Database resource that Lydia had mentioned earlier. This is a very re uh, rich resource that we have. It has over 11 million individuals in the database from the late 18th century. And uh, linked to our EMR system, there are 2.35 million people that you can review their data. So it's very robust. That's what we used for our Utah study. We actually looked at two retrospective studies here. We looked at if you have a triple A diagnosis, what's the likelihood that you could have exfoliation syndrome? And then vice versa, if you have exfoliation syndrome, what's the likelihood that you could also have a triple A? And we did this with ICD-9 and 10 coding. So for the first part, uh, looking at patients who already had a triple A diagnosis, what's the likelihood that they could have exfoliation syndrome or exfoliation gla glaucoma? Our inclusion criteria was anyone over the age of 40 with a triple A diagnosis between 1996 and 2015. We used a five to one ratio of sex and age match controls. Um, and really here in this chart, the big thing is we did not find any significant change in the, the prevalence of exfoliation syndrome, whether or not you had a triple A diagnosis or not. It was 0.3 in both groups, 0.3%. And for the second part of the study, we looked at, and I think this is maybe more the important question when we have exfoliation patients in our clinic, what is the likelihood that they may be at a higher risk of developing a triple A? So here our inclusion criteria was patients 50 years or older with exfoliation present in one or both eyes, and that was done using a text string search. So this also included 
167 patients with open angle glaucoma who had exfoliation just noted in their chart. And patients had to have at least one or more dilated eye exams. We used a three to one sex and age match control here. Um, and in total, we had uh, 3,400 patients with exfoliation syndrome that we were able to look at. So using a multivariable conditional logistic regression analysis that controlled for sex and age, as well as several different socioeconomic factors, ultimately we found even here that patients with um, exfoliation syndrome or exfoliation glaucoma were at no higher risk of developing an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And that was with using 3,400 um, exfoliation syndrome patients and 10,000 control patients in this. So um, the main study strengths for this retrospective chart review is this does seem to be the largest population-based investigation that's looking at this question of could you be at higher risk with either or of the diseases? And this had a total of 7,000 patients with AAA and 3,400 patients with exfoliation syndrome. A lot of the prior studies looked at maybe just addressing this from one end. Maybe um, if you have exfoliation syndrome, are you at a higher risk for a AAA or vice versa, rather than addressing the both of them? Um, we also found very consistent findings between our multivariate and univariate analysis, and this helps demonstrate that even when accounting for relative differences in the case and control cohort characteristics, there truly was no relationship that we were able to identify. Um, we also considered the higher uh, incidence and prevalence of men with AAA compared to women, since that was significantly different, 8% compared to 1.3%, and showed that in a sex stratified analysis, there's still no association. The main um, study limitations here, this is retrospective chart review, and it is using ICD-9 and 10 coding. So that in itself has several limitations. When we did use a convenient sample of 14 patients with exfoliation and uh, AAA diagnoses, only nine of the 14 patients had a true confirmed clinical AAA diagnosis. So there may have been an overestimation of uh, AAA within our Utah population database system. Um, also, the possibility of detecting bias for uh, exfoliation syndrome and exfoliation glaucoma um, is possible based on the differences in eye exams. The exfoliation syndrome group had on average two eye exams per year, whereas the control group only had like 0 0.7 eye exams per year on average. Um, and then for external validity purposes, there is a limitation in the study demographics as this is primarily a non-Hispanic and white patient population in this study. But overall, um, the conclusion is exfoliation syndrome continues to be a multifactorial age-related systemic disorder with genetic and environmental influences and various clinical comorbidities, which to our knowledge does not include triple uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms. There does not seem to be an increased risk there. Um, and this was thankfully published in Acta Ophthalmologica in print last year. And these are my references. And just wanted to say thank you to this amazing team of co-authors that I was able to work with, um, and especially Dr. Orozco, who's been such an incredible research mentor to me. I'm happy to take questions. Great work. Uh, I'm really glad you published this. Sometimes it's hard to publish null results yes. where you find something that isn't associated, but it's super important that it's that that is published because otherwise we think everything's associated with everything. Um, but I just want you to, I, I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit on like how that went with reviewers, like going through that process. Like, do you feel like that, like trying to get null results published was hard and how you like handled that? That is a great question. Um, so I think we sort of approached this a little bit strategically. Um, when I had done my literature review, at the same time, we were also looking at the our data within the Utah population database and kind of knew that we didn't see an association, but we uh, 
published the literature review first, which was showing a lot of conflicting evidence, and then used that to sort of generate a gateway for we just need a bigger data set that's looking at it. And so we actually didn't get a lot of pushback for the second paper, which ultimately didn't show any association. They were kind of like, oh, okay, you're answering a clinical question that was uh, suggested in this last paper. So, yes. Kind of a two for one. It was good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Our last speaker in this session is Samuel Wilkinson, and he will talk about single muscle application in small to moderate angle strabism. And um, one very exciting fact about um, Samuel is that he once swam with humpback whales in Tonga. I want to adjust this back up to medium height mode. Um, unlike Dr. Shakur, I'm not an adventurous diver, but I have been snorkeling with some humpback whales and, uh, we did have a surprise visit from about a 12 foot shark and I was convinced it was a great white, but the guide said it was definitely a reef shark. Let's see, um, all right. And I appreciate everyone sticking with us. I know it's not the, a, the most fun to be the only thing keeping you all from lunch. So we'll make this. Uh, fun, a little bit educational, and and we'll dive right into it. So today we're going to be talking about single muscle plication in small to moderate angle adult strabismus, or a tuck of luck. I do not have any financial disclosures. And strabismus is misalignment of the eye as it affects about 4% of the U.S. population. Strabismus can be categorized by the direction of the misalignment with horizontal strabismus, including esotropia or eyes uh, deviating inward and exotropia, eyes deviated outward. Um, there can also be vertical deviations that we call hypertropias. Uh, treatment approaches typically include observation, prism glasses, surgery, and uh, even vision therapy, although there's some controversy surrounding the efficacy of vision therapy. It's a little bit on the basics of strabismus surgery. There are two primary interventions, uh, recession and resection. First one, uh, rectus muscle recession is when the muscle is displaced posteriorly to decrease its length or tension curve. And a resection is when the part of the muscle is removed to tighten the muscle and increase its length tension curve. Now there's a third approach, which is gonna be the focus of the talk, which is plication. Plication is a method of folding the rectus to tighten the muscle uh, similar to a resection. And uh, we should also talk about adjustable sutures. There are slip knots that are placed uh, mainly in recession uh, procedures that can be used to make alterations in the post-operative or while the patient is awake, rather. Some of the pros of doing a single muscle approach as opposed to a, a two muscle approach is that there's less operative time and thus faster recovery. It simplifies simplified and minimal surgical risk and lower chance of overcorrection. Uh, some of the downsides include higher risk of undercorrection and possible asymmetric correction, leading to an induced lateral incompetence. However, this has actually been looked at in the literature and shown to have a uh, minimal difference between two muscle and one muscle surgery. Muscle plication has a number of uh, advantages, including it's less invasive because the muscle insertion is not resected. Uh, there's early reversibility. Um, however, this is a little bit controversial because sometimes uh, it's hard to tell what long-term post-op uh, outcomes are gonna be during the early post-op period. Uh, there's reduced surgical trauma. There's also a possibility of preservation of the anterior ciliary circulation, which could lead to a decrease of anterior segment ischemia. Um, we also have a decreased risk of losing the muscle and shorter operative time. Uh, some of the downsides include an elevated fold of the conjunctiva, which creates a risk of a delin, and unpleasant uh, short-term cosmetics because of that folding. So we did a retrospective study. We looked at 25 adults who underwent single muscle plication. Uh, all these patients had small to moderate angle horizontal strabismus, and all the cases were performed by a single surgeon uh, we looked at both quantitative outcomes uh, as specifically with strabismus measurements, and we also looked at qualitative uh, measurements based on patient satisfaction. 
here are the demographics of our patient. We had 10 male patients and 15 female patients, ranging in ages from 15 to 88 years old. Median age was 64, and the majority of patients that we looked at had divergence insufficiency. And I want to share a quick video of this procedure. It's on 2x speed. The surgeon isn't actually moving that quickly. Um, so in this, we're doing a, a medial rectus plication, and the surgeon took an approach through the fornix. And they're making sure that there's no tenons adherent to the muscle to minimize contractile folding. And just like that, a 30 second surgery, I know some of our cataract surgeons think they're fast. So since this is a small study, I want to show you data from each of our patients. This graph shows our preoperative and postoperative strabismus measurements for patients with divergence insufficiency. Uh, for reference, the negative values on the vertical axis represent esodeviations, and positive values uh, indicate exodeviations. The blue bars are the preoperative measurements, and the orange bars represent postoperative measurements. Now, patients with divergence insufficiency have more difficulty with seeing of the distance compared to near, which is why I'm showing the distance targets first. Uh, and a reduction of less to less than 10 prism diopters is considered a success in strabismus surgery. So uh, looking through this data, most of our patients ended up with no deviation, and all but one had a postoperative measurement less than 10 uh, prism diopters. Uh, the two patients that you see with the orange bars uh, going in the positive direction or down because it's a flipped flipped axis. Um, they, only two patients were overcorrected, um, and, but even the patient that was overcorrected by about 10 prism diopters was still happy with the outcome and actually uh, wasn't symptomatic from the overcorrection. We also looked at near targets for divergence insufficiency, uh, the goal being to avoid overcorrection for near targets. And again, only one patient was outside of the 10 prism diopter range, uh, but this patient was interesting also not symptomatic from this overcorrection. So looking at our data from our a smaller cohort of convergence insufficiency, um, with convergence insufficiency, there's greater difficulty with seeing near targets. Uh, each patient had improvement in their deviation and all the patients reached the goal of less than 10 prism diopters of deviation. Now, even more importantly, uh, it's we want to avoid overcorrection with this population. And you can see, um, looking at distance targets, uh, there's uh, none of our patients had overcorrection. And then here are the averages from each subgroup. All four postoperative groups averaged less than 10 prism diopters in deviation, with most of the groups being very close to no deviation. We also looked at patient satisfaction. Uh, the vast majority of patients were happy with the postoperative outcomes. Uh, two of the patients had neutral satisfaction. Uh, they actually interestingly presented with complaints uh, that were a little bit separate or a little bit unique. One, for example, had shaky vision that wasn't quite an oscillopsia. Um, and they also had uh, measurable strabismus. So they wanted to see if correcting that strabismus would help them with this subjective shaky vision as well. So um, unfortunately, their shaky vision did not improve, which is why they had kind of a, a neutral um, neutral amount of satisfaction with the outcome. And similarly, there was another patient who presented with dizziness and didn't have any uh, improvement with their dizziness. And then here are the patients broken down into divergence insufficiency and convergence insuff insufficiency when looking at patient satisfaction. And this table actually breaks down the outcomes into different subgroups. Um, each subgroup had the majority of patients with success based on strabismus measurements, as well as positive patient satisfaction. In conclusion, uh, single muscle plication is an underutilized approach to small to moderate angle strabismus uh, in adults with specific utility in convergence and divergence insufficiency. Plication should be the first step in correcting small to moderate angle strabismus. Plication has been around for several decades now. However, this is a, a new application of the surgical technique. We hypothesize that surgical success or outcomes of our study demonstrate it is at least equivalent, if not superior to current techniques presented in the literature. 
and single muscle plication has been shown to be safe and effective in repeat surgical interventions. Um, it also has a similar dose effect to a recession. Uh, size, side gaze incompetence has been evaluated in other studies and shown to have similar or small differences when comparing single muscle to two muscle surgery. So some lim limitations of our study include uh, it's a single center, single surgeon study, and our patients are limited to small to moderate angle strabismus. Uh, we also have limited long-term follow-up data, and we only evaluated patients in primary gaze, uh, no information or no data on lateral gazes. So future plans going forward, we're working with a statistician to finalize our statistical analysis, and then we're actually in the process of preparing a manuscript for the uh, Journal of, of the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus. And then uh, we're going to create a survey of our current patients to collect long-term satisfaction data. And I just want to give you a big thank you to Dr. Jardine, uh, Tanner Nelson, our awesome medical student working on this project, and Ben Brins, our, our fantastic statistician. Um, and thank you all to all of our co-residents. I think this morning we had a master class on how to, how to present great research. So thank you to all of you for being good, good role models for us PGY2s. Yeah. What was your follow-up? Because I think that's the biggest problem with these is those, I think, I don't do plications because I think they unravel more and I don't see the benefit. But I think with a lot of these, once you tighten that muscle, you're good for a little while sometimes, but it doesn't last long. What was your, what was your follow-up? Yeah, so uh, one month for this data. <laughs> yeah, very long-term, especially when you're talking strabismus. I, I, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I yeah, and I don't think, I think you got to separate these out because in my mind, divergence insufficiency and convergence insufficiency are two entirely different animals. And I think those are probably your most unhappy patients are the convergence insufficiency, but. Yeah, I'd love to expand yeah. to track these long. Maybe we shouldn't have touched them. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So great talk. Yeah. Um, interesting subject. For your measurements, you know, small versus medium, how did you separate those two groups? And then for the smaller group, how did you dose your procedures? Yeah. Um, so we actually, we based our, well, for the first question, um, so we looked at patients that had less than 25 prism diopters of deviation. Um, it, with normal tables, they recommend that for 15 prism diopters or more that you operate on two muscles. Uh, so we actually took the tables with the two muscle surgery or the two muscle tables and looked at what would be prescribed or dosed for a, um, a two muscle recession. And then we doubled that and subtracted about half to one, one millimeter. So kind of a, a rough formula. My health on red can run up here with it. You know, I've had the opportunity to reoperate uh, 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 quite a few patients who've had plications. I agree, Dr. Young. I think that actually the idea that you can take it apart was one of the big selling features when people started talking about this. But once it starts to heal, it is very difficult to undo it. On the other hand, it is not difficult to reoperate the muscles. So it, it is amenable to further surgery. I think this is good work. Um, and uh, it's encouraging. And, uh, you know, this issue in particular, the idea of doing a resection on a single muscle is the only surgery is something that isn't commonly thought of. So this is, this is a really good thing to bring up. And, uh, well, I'll look forward to hearing more about this. I think it's exciting. And that was a great talk. Thank you.